Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is January 21st, year 2024, 4 p.m. PDT, Pacific Daylight Time. Welcome. And today's topic is the mind games of the intelligence community. IC stands for intelligence community. Mind games and the slaying of John Winston Lennon. Yes, his middle name was Winston standing for Winston Churchill. That was a common uh, given name back during the war years in uh, Britain. I guess I'd have a sense of uh, patriotic allegiance, but that's John W. Lennon. And today we're going to be looking at, well, revisiting, in truth, the assassination of John Winston Lennon on December 8th, year 2000. I'm sorry, <laughs> not 2000, in uh, 1980. Oh, my gosh. It's been so many years since then. And uh, the book is, um, let me see if it's reflecting, correct. Mind Games. Sorry, there's some glare there. I'll read it for you. The Assassination of John Lennon. And it's by David Whelan, or Wellen, W-H-E-L-A-N. Published by Orwell Books. Um, I don't know if that's in reference to George Orwell or some other individual from history. But it was published in 2023. And from what I know, I think this is only the second serious book detailing the assassination of John Lennon. The first one being... Who Killed John Lennon? Question mark by Fenton Bressler, and I've cited that book more than once in previous talks. Speaking of which, uh, I was interviewed by Matt Williamson just a few days ago for Pop Goes the '60s, and uh, it was an incredible conversation about historiography and the Beatles. That is, how do professional historians or journalists write about the Beatles and certain members of them, primarily John Lennon and Paul McCartney, but to a certain extent, uh, George Harrison, but McCartney and Lennon, definitely. And uh, that show, from what Matt tells me, will be airing sometime next week. When As soon as I get the link and the information, I'll forward it to my people on Patreon. And toward that end, you can see below, there's a Patreon link for those of you who are not one of my supporters. And for as little as $5 a month, you can be getting all these goodies. This is just the tip of the iceberg that I'm presenting here on TubeU. Uh, number one, there's not enough time. I like to keep these talks down to 60 minutes. And second, the nature of my approach, which I call cultural forensics, is such that uh, it is susceptible to being, <laughs> shall we say, censored or given a strike, right, under the guise of various, uh, I don't know, rules and regulations, terms of use. You know, I understand copyright and I understand fair use. So anyway, if you want to get much more material, sign up for my Patreon. I have an active presence there. And we go back and forth with the membership there. And I Upload, if you're not familiar with the Patreon platform, I upload a lot of videos there that I get from other sources or from my own archive and um, a lot of articles, some PDF uh, articles and even some books, some rare books that should belong into every serious researchers or even any serious student of the popular culture, especially if you're dealing with some of the more dark side of our uh, society, culture, and economics. And um, the membership is holding quite consistently. I'm, it's, the membership roles continue to grow. And I'm saying this is because, from what I can tell, uh, everybody who's signed up is quite pleased with the, the level of uh, service that they're receiving from me. So with that advertisement out of, out of the way, We'll see you next week on Pop Goes the 1960s, hosted by Matt Williamson. But for today, let's uh, delve into the heart of this book right here. I also want to remind you 
as I did on Matt Williamson's show uh, the a uh, few days ago, that there's still some used copies of who killed John Lennon floating around on the interweb, such as in uh, Amazon. And uh, I'll give you a, a tip, a hot tip. Those, those, the, the book's out of print, and I don't know if it'll ever be <clears throat> reissued. It should be. Vincent Bressler passed away. I don't know how many years ago, but he is, he is uh, gone. And not to uh, revise that uh, wonderful book of his, pathbreaking book, which, and I keep hammering away. It is not adequately being treated as part of the Beatles' history, individually or collectively. It's not part of the Beatles historiography. And it's, um, it's, um, I don't know if it's a calculated omission, but it is such a glaring gap in most of these uh, works, whether they be pretend to be scholarly or journalistic, that it makes me really scratch my head. How can you really talk about the Beatles and or John Lennon in specific and not deal with the uh, the reality of his um, assassination, his murder. So we're going to, toward that end, we're going to be delving or really raising more questions than answering, courtesy of the fine work by David Welling, the, the author of this book. From what I understand, he's a journalist, but honestly, this is the first book or even article that I've read of his. Uh, I don't know much about him. Maybe he's well known in Britain, but I'll, I'll keep looking at it. And the reason I raise this is because always when you're doing this kind of work, you have to consider the source, right? He could be flack, right? He could be intelligence. I don't think he is, but there's all kinds of motives that are involved in writing books. Not all just uh, pecuniary motives either. He is a Television producer, according to what I understand. And we're going to see a clip of him in a moment. Maybe you can study his body language to see if he's real or not. I watch those YouTubes and find them in interesting, but I don't really rely on them in any sort of definitive fashion. But there is some truth to uh, speech patterns, body language, and, and assessing the the veracity or falsity of certain statements. So anyway, just keep that caveat in mind when we go through this. This is does not constitute an endorsement. However, I will say that um, any even casual reader of the Beatles uh, biographies and anthologies, music, films, documentaries, this is a must for your library. And if you're interested in popular music, this is a must for your library. If you're interested in the new world order, especially in the post sixties period, post war, that is uh, 19 late 1940s to the present time. This is an ind indispensable volume for your understanding of our history. And again, I hate to, to the people in my chat room right now. And thank you. Uh, Zwana do and Dolly two twenty two and uh, freedom Two Twenty Three and, Debbie Zopina and um, Christy Liebel, and I'm sorry if I'm missing all your, your names. I'll kind of shoot them up periodically if we are watching some videos here. Uh, I know that you know this material, but uh, just to let you know, some people are coming into this body of work as uh, relatively in inexperienced researchers, especially younger people. And uh, the danger with that is that as we've talked uh, between ourselves, Matt Williamson, over two different interviews, the danger in that is that they're being exposed to the Beatles were a psyops fabrication of the intelligence agencies or EMI or some combination thereof. Uh, that is, they don't really consider the possibility that human beings who have a soul, a spirit, and a humanity can make music and make art. Are we really that far off that that we we cannot really recognize that that we have this innate uh, creative ability? And there are these four lads from Liverpool of all places. Uh, of course, it's world famous now, so far as the pop music is concerned. But it was a world city long before the Beatles ever showed up. And I've covered that in previous talks uh, relating to the Beatles. Uh, the danger is that the people who are coming into this 
discourse will automatically default into these ass clowns who insist that the Beatles are an entirely a fabrication. And then there's an offshoot of that is the Paul is dead, right? And it's mostly clickbait. It's very easy. It doesn't require any thinking to put in my comments below. Yes, Paul is dead and the Beatles were Tavis dog, blah, 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 woof, woof. We've heard it before. So if you're of that ilk, uh, watch the channels for wankers like yourself. But if you really wanted to delve deeply into the realities of our situation in 2024, which goes far beyond the Beatles, right? It includes the Beatles, but it goes far beyond them. It includes the Beatles because, especially John Lennon, it's because he was targeted by the intelligence agencies back then, right? When John Lennon was targeted. I think they all were, but we're focusing on Lennon today. Um, back then we weren't so, so cognizant of the um, FBI transgressions. COINTELPRO, the historians have written about it it's an acronym, COINTELPRO, Counterintelligence Program, run by uh, J. Edna Hoover. It's actually J. Edgar Hoover through different... I mean, it's, it's, it's silly. It's ridiculous the amount of uh, material that's on there for you to read. And um, But that history has been kind of lost until Mr. Whalen has uh, resuscitated again. And I'm hoping this will renew a revisit by legitimate researchers uh, looking to the circumstances of his death, right? I think it's going to whet your appetite if you are of that mind. So one of the main uh, conclusions, and when you buy the book, I would go to the summary first. I often read the books backwards and <laughs> to front, but go to the summary. It's It gives you the overview, but other than that, by the way, there's uh, this book is nicely organized because at the end of each chapter, there is a a summary, a very brief summary of what you had just read, so that you because there's a lot of names, there's a lot of details, well documented, by the way. There there is um, there's even an index. <laughs> okay, a lot of these books don't have indexes. They really are books on the Beatles and popular culture in general, or done by fans, and they. Uh, they glossed over any sort of references, and that's how uh, mistruths and mythologies and disinformation gets gets put through there. So for the most part, from what I can tell, Mr. Whalen has also given us the, the origins of certain comments, uh, observations by... And he, he, he interviewed also many, many eyewitnesses or people close to the scene. They might not... Of course, not have seen the actual murder, but they were they were considered to be "quote unquote" secondary witnesses. <clears throat> and one person, which is you'll, you're going to learn a lot if you read this book. One person who I thought was not even in question so far as being a witness is concerned is one Yoko Ono, right? Because as you most of you, you should know this, right? That she was with John Lennon when he was shot. Uh, but she has, according to Whalen, claims that she has never claimed that she saw Mark David Chapman shoot uh, John Lennon, and she was there. And um, she, he gives a lot of he gives her kind of the benefit of the doubt, but not quite. That uh, she might have blanked out. It could be post traumatic stress disorder, or she could have been distracted, misremembered. I mean, it's, it's kind of a really intense situation to be in. So we can kind of understand that. But uh, there's some other information there that, that, that's, that puts a question mark in the, in, in the, in the narrative here and that um, Yoko Ono donated a lot of money to the NYPD who proved to be, I won't say incompetent, but let's just say incomplete in their forensic uh, inspection of the site. They, they, it was kind of like a shut and in America we call it a you know an open and shut case, right? And and again, Whelan gives the, the police department a slight bit of the doubt. They say, well, it's in the Christmas time and New York City police department had been going through a lot of uh, hassles and political issues, and um, 
were, were very uh, quick to wrap up the case. It seemed like they had the perpetrator. He was standing right there, as most of you know, holding supposedly Catcher in the Rye. That's another m myth that I was disabused of. Uh, but he was, he was sitting, he didn't run away. They didn't have to go after him down the subway and chase him down. And plus he admitted doing it. Now the question is raised, and this is covered in the Whelan book. The question arises whether Mark David Chapman was in his right mind when he admitted to murdering John Winston Lennon. He pled guilty at his trial uh, so that we don't know. There was no testimony given. He, pl he pled, pled guilty and put himself at the mercy of the courts who promptly, uh, promptly sent him to Attica Prison, which at the time was, was one of the worst in the entire federal prison system. There, there had been a riot. Uh, it was covered in the movie uh, Dog Days in the Afternoon, starring Al Pacino, by the way. Uh, Attica, 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 and there were like something like 37 Guards and inmates were killed in a four-day riot. So it was a tough, tough place to do your time. And he's still in prison. He's I'm talking about Mark David Chapman. And he's gone through uh, a number of, I, can, I don't know the exact number, a number of parole hearings, and it's been denied every single time. And one of his ardent supporters all through all this has been Gloria Chapman, her uh, birth name is Abe, A-B-E. It's not Abe, it's pronounced Abe. It's a Japanese name. She's, a, I think, probably Sansei, third-generation Japanese-American Hawaii, from Hawaii. Um, and I learned a lot about her. She was interesting because she has a background similar to mine. Um, but there's some, uh, again, raised by Whalen. I'll try to remember to distinguish my own observations between that and Whalen. But according, according to Whalen, and this is the the, um, the most I've ever been able to read about Gloria Abe. Oh, he, she was his wife, Mark David Chapman's wife. This most uh, exhaust, and she wasn't interviewed by Whale, and she refused to be interviewed. But this is the most exhaustive treatment of, I think, a very important character in this whole scenario, in this historical uh, event that uh, kind of, I think, put the capstone on on youth rebellion of the 1960s. That was part of the reason for that. That's my analysis. I think Whalen might agree with that as well. Uh, Whalen, go, the author, goes so far as to say that maybe it's the wrong Chapman who's in prison. This is what he concludes in the summary, and that's a pretty, pretty bold statement. And um, I was reading through the book, and I tried to understand on what basis does he think that that she's in any way culpable for his being um, involved wrapped up in this case which by the way i hope you're beginning to infer that whalen does not think that mark david chapman was the shooter right even fenton bressler did not question the supposed fact that Mark David Chapman was the shooter, he was really, Bressler was really good at supplying the biographical backstory as to why Mark David Chapman was the likely shooter. But Whalen adds an entirely different dimension to this very important historical episode in, uh, in invoking what we know now. Breslin was not privy, Bressler, I'm sorry, Bresler was not pri privy to what we know now about the national security state, quote unquote, right? The intelligence age community, IC, intelligence community, the FBI, the CIA, MI6, and uh, the Office of Naval Intelligence. There's dozens of them. Then also corporations have their own private internal intelligence agencies. Uh, the Bresler book came out in what 1980, so that's quite a long time ago. And there's been, a, as most of you know, in, in the chat room who read this literature, <laughs> you know that even Dr. Seuss was connected to intelligence, right? And he's the guy that taught a couple of generations, three or four generations of Americans to read, right? So it's not far fetched to um, to bring them from what we now have read. Uh, about the intelligence community to 
to understand this is a is an intelligence operation and as welling uh welland would would assert is a patsy p-a-t-s-y a patsy along the lines of other assassin slash patsies the most well known to us perhaps would be a lee harvey oswald right I mean, didn't he utter when he was brought out in chains before he was shot by Jack Ruby? I'm a patsy, right? And subsequently, researchers, journalists, um, interviewees have uh, substantiated, at least to my satisfaction, substantiated the fact that indeed Lee Harvey Oswald was not the single shooter and uh, it, Lee Harvey Walls, uh, Oswald was probably not the assassin. Probably because there's always a grain of doubt that 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 uh, persists. And I said second, or not the only assassin, because we're going to talk about other very briefly in passing here, other examples of where there were two shooters. So Wayland's assertion is not far fetched at all. It seems to fit a pattern of two patterns. One of the Patsy, the setup, the guy who set up. Right, they put the gun in his hand. That's what a patsy, a put pats, patsy, pazzo means a fool in Italian, right? So it's someone who's a, a useful idiot, right? Um, Mark David Chapman was not an idiot, but he was mind controlled. Whalen says that, and Bresler before him says that. And those of us who've read the literature on MK Ultra find that a convincing argument. We'll talk more about that in a moment because. The grooming and the control mechanism takes different forms, as you know. Right now in 2024, leading in previous years, we, we know that there's an enormous infrastructure that's wed to corporations and the government and law enforcement itself that is based upon uh, human trafficking, child trafficking, more specifically, trafficking of men and women, adults, drugs, of course, illegal immigration is a form of trafficking. I think you can define it as it's not a humanitarian issue. It's a, well, it is in part, but it's largely to traffic children and vulnerable, uh, vulnerable adults, unprotected people into the United States for exploitation, economic, sexual and also helps the careers of people who are uh, supposedly Whitinos or their their uh, high paid six figure income officers of Unidos, formerly called La Raza, or their uh, certain Latinos who are being set up by the Jesuits right now to reach a high political office. Right, right. They need that that electorate, that body of exploitable people in order to get their agenda across, right? So we, we know all that. We know about the Patsy. We know how these intelligence organizations operate. We've seen the playbook. We've seen the formula. We ourselves, within our own living memory, have seen these operations being imposed on us, right? John Lennon, John Winston Lennon, was a singular target of the intelligence agencies. By 2024, it's the American people who's the target of the intelligence agencies, which includes military intelligence, and extended to the entire world, right? That, that, and this is in reference to what's happening right now in Davos, Davos, Switzerland, right? The playground, the meeting place of the self-selected elite within the um, this coterie of the banking Odies, who decide the fate of humanity amongst themselves while they're converting with high-priced call girls, right? They're fully booked right now in Davos. So you want to follow that, uh, that circus right now. And uh, there are quite reputable institutions, including the Heritage Institute, that are calling them out. There's one gentleman from the Heritage that's uh, it's a U.S.-based think tank, by the way, which I never liked. I still am suspicious of them. They might be uh, doing a limited hangout operation. But uh, one of their representatives is uh, part of the official guest list of Davos, and he's telling the elites that, uh-uh, no, no, no. We're going to reject you and repudiate you. 
Uh, we'll see if that happens or not. But what it's doing for the rest of us, right, who don't have access to the higher reaches of power, it uh, supports our suspicions <laughs> that uh, the ceremonial politicking that we're seeing, because, you know, Donald Trump uh, supposedly won two different, and I'm a supporter of his, by the way, um, he won two um, uh, elections recently, and um, some of the other ones have fallen by the wayside, right? This is all related to these, because they're all intelligence operations, okay? That's the point I'm trying to make here. <laughs> uh, and that's why, if I have to justify it at all, that's why this case that's that's decades old is, is relevant. It's an important for us to understand in 2024. Okay. I'm not going to go into his forensic analysis. When I say forensic, he's not a forensic specialist, but he's a reporter. And I, I give him the benefit of the doubt so far as his trustworthiness is concerned. And he has consulted experts, quote unquote, in forensics. But the angle, the distance that uh, the bullet would have had to travel in order to create a very tight pattern in the front of John Lennon's body, by the way, not in the back. Because probably like you, I had always thought that Mark David Chapman shot John Lennon in the back as he was walking away. But the pattern was in the front. We'll see a short video um, clip in a moment that has the audio of the surgeon who was in the in the operating room talking about it. I mean, they, they should be in the best position to see that there were entry wounds in the front and exit wounds in the back. Okay. So anyway, that's just one of many anomalies so far as the criminalistics of the case is concerned. That's, that's one of the more glaring, and it's, it's one of the big surprises for me. And that tends to eliminate Mark David Chapman as a shooter or the single shooter. And the angle was also impossible. Uh, and and uh, there's even an illustration here of the alcove or the the courtyard where the crime was committed and he um the whalen the author details some of the physical characteristics of the entry area of the uh, dakota and uh, the concierge area speaking of which he also um he waits to the end of the book <laughs> that's why i always read the summary first um to to bring in the name of the concierge, she says that we have to take a look at who this guy is. For one, I, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Whalen, if I'm giving away the the um, the plot here, but uh, he does point out because he does his research. Right, this is this is an exercise in supporting Mr. Whalen, not taking away his book sales. All right, but he does mention the fact that the, the concierge uh, has a like a three-year gap in his employment record. Like, where was he? What was he doing before he became the concierge of the esteem, the elite, the high security Dakota? If you don't know what the Dakota is, you look it up on your own. Uh, there's uh, <laughs> a lot of talent and a lot of wealth that lives in uh, the, the Dakota and the Lennons, you know, Yoko Ono, John Lennon, occupied uh, an entire floor of it. They were that wealthy and privileged, right? So that was a, a new uh, reveal for me. That's something for historians and general uh, journalists to to look into, to uh, to s substantiate or or invalidate that claim. I had read that there was a the doorman named Jose Perdomo. Someone read, wrote an entire. You see the long manuscript or short book saying that it was Jose Perdomo who had was the was the actual gunman. So the notion of a gunman other than Mark David Chapman, that argument had already been floated, but but that was the gun, so to speak, was put in the hands of this guy Jose Perdomo for reasons that are somewhat compelling. And I, I read the that long piece and took it under advisement, but I still was um, like most people was convinced that, um, or, or assumed that it was Mark David Chapman who pulled the trigger. <clears throat> Mark David Chapman recalls pulling the trigger five times and four bullets hit, hit their target. Now, why is he misremembering this? 
it's not so much as a matter of misremembering as a, as a matter of implanted memories. I know the distinction is very uh, subtle, but uh, you have to follow Wayland's argument. And, and if you really want a an advanced understanding of the assassination and the argument, then you have to start with Bressler, okay? Who killed John Lennon? And uh, some of you are already prepared, having read about MK Ultra. Now, you know, the work of, of one Annie Jacobson is a limited hangout. It's uh, just been ripped off from other people who came before her. They're cited, of course, and she went back and interviewed a lot of people. But uh, the Annie Jacobson work on MK Ultra, most of it's true because it's all been exposed by now. It's not a big revelation. The people who were doing this work and who were persecuted for it politically um, uh, are, are the ones responsible for that. So, and I'm telling you this because, so far as historiography is concerned, there are these pop up pundits that you can learn from, but don't and don't stop there. They they pop up for a reason to say that the story is over. This is all we know. This is all we need to know. Nothing to see here. Move along. Okay, that's the only reason why I name check these people is so that you do not say, oh, yeah, okay, I know the story. I got it. No, you don't know the story. Nobody knows the story. Even people who say that, oh, I've read the, I've uh, written the definitive history of X, Y, and Z, that, you know, you'll never be unemployed if you're a historian because there's always new information, documents, approaches, insights. And creativity. You have to make creative leaps in your imagination when you do this kind of work. It's not just a matter of saying, okay, here's a footprint here. Here's, here's, a, here's a, um, a fingerprint and here's this and, and, and size it all up. No, the best detectives, detectives, the best writers, the best researchers, the best deep journalists. I call them deep journalists as opposed to journalists who just kind of say who, what, where, right? Just the details, ma'am. But they don't talk about the why and the motivation, right? Those people are the deep reporters, the deep journalists. It requires creativity and uh, it requires life experience too. If you're a candy ass wimp who only who grew up playing video games, then yeah, you're very susceptible to um, all these crazy uh, simplistic ideas about the world and how it really operates. Why do you think video games were invented, right? That's, that's your, that is your historical horizon, which is not, not history at all. It's playing history, you know. They, have, they draw from historical events, and you think you know all you need to know about the Peloponnesian Wars, right? Or the fall of the, of the temple in 70 AD, right? You're playing a video game. You're LARPing. You're live-action role-playing. You've got to read the books. All right. I'm, I'm belaboring <clears throat> these historiographic points because I have people who are just coming into the Beatles study right now, and I want to warn you in advance. Okay. So far as second shooters, I alluded to the fact that this is not the first time a single shooter or a second shooter, I'm sorry, a second shooter theory has been forwarded in cases of these really huge, dramatic assassinations or murders, right? We've got Lee Harvey Oswald, which I already mentioned. There was the infamous, and I don't know what books they've appeared in. I've read a lot of the literature. I don't claim expert status, but I've read it. It's just like I read a lot of the Beatles literature. I don't claim expert status because I don't know what kind of underwear Paul McCartney was wearing uh, back in uh, in Hamburg, right? I don't I don't know all that. Um, but I, I do have the other elements of discernment and background and the creative uh, background to to put two and two together. And so do you. So you've read about the two Oswalds, right, in these books. There was a guy that was a little bit taller than him. Uh, and I'm not even talking about the, 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 the uh, altered photos that appeared in Life magazine. You know, this is before Photoshop. Or maybe Photoshop did exist. It's just civilians weren't, didn't have it yet, right? You know that story. You know about Life Magazine. You know about C.D. Jackson and the relationship of the media we know now in 2024. 
how close it was to the intelligence agencies back around the time where when uh, John F. Kennedy was was murdered. But another few more cases, and I'll leave it at that, where you have second shooters, so-called second shooters. The other one was Malcolm X, the great leader, the civil rights leader, shot in uh, Manhattan at the Audubon Ballroom. This is on February 1st, 1965. Okay, 1965. And this, by the way, this is a couple of years after he had commented on the assassination of JFK and said something kind of cryptic, like, well, the chickens have come home to roost. Obviously, Malcolm X had known about political assassinations, and um, but he didn't really elaborate. He, I think he got censured by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad for making such uh, political statements, and eventually they, they broke apart. And I mention that is because there's some suspicion that the Nation of Islam had a hand in his assassination. Now, an individual by the name of Thomas Hagen, I'll mention his name because he was arrested, he was imprisoned, was seen as the shooter uh, of Malcolm X. He was assassinated on stage while he was giving a talk to the audience. Uh, and two other people from the Nation of Islam, two, two of them went to prison, one of them, and both of them were later exonerated, right? So we can see where there's second shooters can be um, kind of thrown in into the mix, is, I guess, insurance or distraction. I don't know, but mistakes can happen. And so two of those guys were exonerated. Um, one, I think it was uh, posthumously, right? So that's another example. Another example is James Earl Ray. You should know that name by now because there's been tons of work uh, written about him. William Pepper, he's an attorney by training. Uh, has written a couple of great books on the assassination of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. He was, and I, I was alive at the time, and, and I, I saw the news. Yes, well, they've apprehended the killer of of the Reverend Martin Luther King, James Earl Ray, and they, they paint him the most disparaging light, of course. And uh, as a little punky kid, I go along with the story. So do my parents, and we were reading the Los Angeles Times and reading the next month's issue of Life magazine telling us the reality, a fake reality, as it turns out. We know now in 2024 that uh, not only was there more than one shooter, but uh, James Earl Ray was not one of them. I am fairly, and I was put a little caveat there, I'm fairly convinced that he he might have been involved in the plot, but he was not the shooter, yeah, James Earl Ray. There's enough literature on that that... Uh, is, is convincing. Even members of the of the King family say he's not the guy, right? Uh, Dexter King, the son of Martin Luther King Jr., had pursued that for years and years and years. Finally, they kind of decided within the family that they weren't going to pursue it anymore. The you know the, the the truth, but that doesn't mean that we can't, and that doesn't mean that we can can cannot benefit from these lessons here, right? Heaven forbid, what if there's an assassination going into the election of 2024, right? Knowing this backstory and this history and these patterns can prepare us to, to avoid these, or mitigate, let's say, or reduce the possibility of these types of events from happening. The American public will immediately suspect certain institutions and individuals within them if something goes wrong with the with the election, whether it involves an assassination or a theft of votes or some other weird unforeseen scenario that we we are just waiting for, right? Like another pestilence visited upon the American. It could be disease X. It could be Ebola. We 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 don't know, right? I'm not saying that's going going to happen, but we're hearing a lot of noise, signal noise here predicting a lot of uh, chaos running up into the election. But we're this time we are prepared historically understanding the sociology of knowledge production. We know about legacy media. They're crashing. They're starting to put their money in seemingly independent media on TubeView. Those are the ones with millions of viewers. I only have... Um, 12,000 subscribers, so I guess I'm not part of intelligence, right? 
Um, but please subscribe to me anyway, okay? Yeah, make me into a 12 million subscriber, man. I want to be bigger than Joe Rogan. I'm not saying he's part of intelligence. Uh, but there are reasons why certain supposedly indie pop-up pundit people. I mean, this guy was a stand-up comedian. He was the host of Fear Factor. How did this guy become a multi-million dollar, uh, comp which is fine, compensated, to be a political pundit? He doesn't know anything. All right. That's all I'm going to say about that. I guess I'm just bitter because I'm so obscure. Right. Uh, Finally, most of you know about Sirhan Bishara Sirhan. He was the accused assassin of Robert F. Kennedy at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. This is way back on June 5th, 1968. And again, I was alive. I was a little punky kid when this happened. In my childhood, there were all these assassinations. You know, I almost take it for granted that, that people are, you know, we're living in a third world country where, where elections are divided by the ballot or the bullet and not the ballot, right? They're just, uh, they're decided by, um, Plomo, which is lead Plata o Plomo. They're decided by both now. <clears throat> so, um, in most of these cases, by the way, and I'm not going to dwell on it too much because I don't have enough time, but in most of these cases, in the post-war period, there was always psychologists or psychiatrists and or hypnotists that were assigned to interview these characters, right? From what I can tell, because I've read a lot of literature on all of it, it doesn't make me an expert, but at least I've poured through the literature. And that independently of the published literature, I've gone off on my own and done my own original research on this, okay? But it seems like in every single case, it's the psychiatrist and psychologist who supposedly are viewed with godlike qualities and abilities to get into the real truth of a, of a perpetrator's mind, right? These are the head shrinkers. But in truth, we know, at least I know, maybe you're going to have to still think about this, ponder it. These guys work for the national security state. They most of them belong to intel. To use that memorable phrase, belong to intelligence, right? Alexander Acosta said this about Jeffrey Epstein. He belongs to intelligence. That's why uh, we, you know, we had to let him let him go with a wrist slap, right? And look what what happened when he was run. He was running free. He became worse. And this is the reason why we need. We need justice because we're we are just adding fuel to the fire. Jeff Epstein was not going to stop until he was brought in, and even then, I don't know if he's fully stopped now because there's people who is who are in that milieu who are running around free. And at this juncture, I would recommend the deep journalism of one Kirby Summers, if you want the details about this. It goes very very deep. It goes very, very dark. If you're one of those people who will be quote unquote triggered by reading these these really harsh realities of how the world really operates on the metaphysical plane of evil, of Satanism, the prince of darkness, then you'll have to check out her work. And um, I don't think it's it's possible for us to turn away from these metaphysical realities. Right. If you want a little softer landing, right? Let's say you're you're not quite mature enough, or you're not quite able to sustain the truth of how horrible the leadership is, the true leadership. I'm not talking about the ceremonial leadership, but the true mensch who run America and the world. Then you can. I would recommend reading the work of uh, Jonathan Kahn. Right, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, uh, who talks about through history, through human history, through civilizational history, the people who turn away from God and and ethics and humanity, right? These these civilizations are destroyed. So maybe you want to come in it from that direction. That's also good. I would could recommend that. 
In fact, maybe that's where you should start because it, it starts and ends with the spiritual, the metaphysical, right? And that's where people like Waylon, that's not his job, but that's where he's not covering it. That's where Bresler does not tread. This is my contribution here, right, to, to the discussion of why there's there are bad people running around in America right now free. They're not all in prison, and they're not all dead of a supposed suicide. They're not all on probation. A lot of them are running free. And um, until they're stopped, they're going to keep compounding these problems that we're experiencing. None of, them, none of these problems, by the way, are of natural origins. Right? Even you're talking about medical problems, they're not of natural origins. Well, they're man-made. So certainly social and economic problems are man-made. Who's behind them? What's behind it? What are the ideas? What are the metaphysics behind it? Those are the questions that, that I ask. Uh, I can't go into right now because I don't have enough time. But uh, subscribe to my channel and my Patreon, and you will understand more fully why you're going broke and why there's hyperinflation and why there's been more billionaires created in the last 20 years than ever before in human history, and what, how are you going to get out of it, right? And it's not as simple as an election. It's not as simple as going there and uh, pulling, a, pulling a lever or punching out a chad or a candidate in X, Y, Z. It's not as simple, but it's, it is simple in a way because it deals with your own relationship with the with God, okay? So let's move on into the final lap here of mind games and um, talk about uh, the occult. Now, one thing to revisit, and those of you who think that she's not an important character, well, I was in, you know, that same, of that same mind until I read this book, and I realized that Gloria Chapman Abe, or Gloria Abe Chapman, is a key figure in the assassination of John Lennon. Did she pull the trigger? I don't know. Probably not. Uh, was she the selfless, helpful, obedient Japanese wife of Mark Chapman? That's how it's presented in a lot of the literature. But as it turns out, she might have had, uh, according to Whalen, I think, might have had other motives to keep close to the man who's serving a a life term in prison. You don't want him to have a have a moment where he starts blabbing, right? And and again, I didn't finish my thought earlier. That's one of the reasons why they attach these compromised psychologists and psychiatrists to these super high profile cases. They're not even high profile. They're part of these this control mechanism. Don't take my word to it. There's a philosopher, Michel Foucault, who who wrote extent, he's considered to be a god in the philosophy pantheon and ranging from comparative literature to the social sciences. Michel Foucault, even though he was into bondage and discipline and died of so-called AIDS, um, he did have these very important uh, uh, insights into psychiatry and its use as, for, as control, as a political control. When our society, especially American society, Man, you know, I taught at the university that these people are not going to rest until they have a psychotherapist for every single student who's enrolled in the university. They have taken over. They've taken over American society, beginning with the kids from K through 12 through the university. And that's all manifested itself in GLBTQ+, in Black Lives Matter, in Antifa. It's all a psyop. And I'm not just talking out of my patootie, ladies and gentlemen. I got the literature talking about this that details it, right? And I don't want to oversimplify, but it has to do with a cohort of Austrian and German Jews who were brought in pre-paperclip. Paperclip was not just a sexy Nazi operation. It was there was a Jewish component to it that preceded, and these were the therapists. Right, and they settled in places like London. That's uh, Sigmund Hoyt, and some of them settled in New York City. Some of them settled in San Francisco. I've talked about this already when I've given my talks on Philip K. Dick because he was one of the victims of these mindfuckers. Right, there's a book by that by 
edited by David Dalton, Straight Arrow Press, which used to be Rolling Stones publisher before they became globalists, right? This is when Jan Wenner, Wenner still had the paper. It was a newspaper. It was a uh, folio or um, it was not the, the, the format that we see today. This is the same, back in San Francisco days, right? Um, so we see these recur rec recurrent patterns here. Um, finish up on the psychology track. It's no accident. We're kind of straying away from John Lennon's assassination. It's no accident that uh, John Lennon pursued his salvation, not through God, right? He repudiated God. And I think he was coming back to God of, of his childhood, right? In Liverpool. Um, but his life, personal life was filled with these psychotherapists, right? Psychotherapists, people like Arthur Janoff, who, by the way, his parents are from the Ukraine, Janoff, right? When you hear, when I hear Ukraine, when I hear of these people like Leslie Wexner, courtesy of the deep journalist, Kirby Summers, you know, their, their people are from Russia, right? I'm thinking Sabatee and Frankis. I'm thinking about Zabatai Zev. I'm thinking about Yakub Frank, right? Th these are the people who inverted Judaism upside down so they could hasten the arrival of the Messiah so that the whole world would be destroyed and we can all be raptured out. I don't think they use that term, but we'll we'll, we'll have a new world, a new beginning. So let's let's in, engage in all kinds of transgressive in, activity. That's their, the term of the postmodernists, the people that performance studies and GLBTQ. They're so transgressive that the men dress as women, the women dress as men. Transmutation. This is all metaphysical. It comes from, from the Sabbatean. It's, uh, it's parts of it, all of it is condemned by the uh, Talmud and the Tanakh. It was inverted, okay? But these people migrated to the United States of America, and one of them was uh, Arthur Janov's people. <laughs> He's Ukrainian. What do you think? Why do you think the United States and, and NATO is fighting over Ukraine right now? That's where that's where it is, man. That's where it, where it all started. They want Kiev. They want Belarus, or what was Belarus? They want to 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 get the homeland of the evil, get it back into the new into the new world order uh, fold, which is NATO, right? So anyway, John of um, did the uh, primal scream therapy. Uh, you might have heard it caric caricatured or lampooned. Uh, you can check it in. Um, I never put much, you know, and I was, uh, again, I've been around so long. I was there when John of hit because, you know, like everybody else of my generation, we were following anything that John Lennon was up to. And he had discovered this new therapy, him and Yoko Ono, who was a very much controlling presence in his life, largely through therapy, by the way. Uh, that comes from another book. Maybe this is another talk. And this is why I'm harping on the psychotherapeutic mind control aspect of his uh, assassination. And Whelan does a very good job in talking about not just uh, MK Ultra, but also related cults outside of the national security uh, complex. But anyway, um, for those of you who are not interested in Janov per se, you would be interested to know that the first solo album by John Lennon, it was the Plastic Ono Band. I have a, the original copy and I have the the CD versions, of course. It's one of the best works by anything Beatles related, I think. And it's certainly, I think, the best album of all the whole John Lennon oeuvre that uh, who knows where he would have, might have taken his music had he lived. Uh, Plastic Ono Band, that, that there's a lot of um, primal therapy influence in it because he was looking to recover his self that he felt was a buried, the buried child. That was a, a play by Sam Shepard. He was looking for the inner child that had been buried by what is today called trauma, right? His, you know the story about his mother being run over by an off-duty cop. You know about Alf Lennon who abandoned him. Mama, don't go. Father, come home. You know, <laughs> that's the song, Mother. That's on Plastic Ono. You know about all those tribulations. You've seen the documentary film. If you haven't, you should. Called Loving John by uh, May Pang. 
it's a breakthrough movie because it's the first movie I know where a yellow woman gets to speak about her own life. Usually it's about someone else, right? Or they put some some character in there, you know, that uh, that has uh, been envisioned by Quentin Tarantino, the world's oldest fanboy. But for once, a yellow person gets to tell her story. So watch that. I will end up. My friend and colleague Matt Williamson did an excellent interview with May Pang uh, a couple of weeks ago. So look for Pop Goes the Sixties and, and look at that because um, you you can tell that they 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 have a simpatico going on. They understand each other even though they're separated in generation. And that's the way it's going to work. That's the way it's going to happen if we were to get out of this morass that has been engineered for us. And we're not responsible for it. We pay for it, right? We're subsidizing our own hell uh, by these characters. But um, don't feel guilty about, about um, well, I won't call it victimage because to a certain extent we are complicit in our victimage. But uh, look a little bit further outside the usual suspects. Don't blame candidate X, Y, or Z, whoever it is you're, that you're following or favoring or thinker ABC. Oh yeah, she's got all the answers here. This guy here, Broken, I've been listening to his stuff for years and years. I watch his YouTube channel. I'm a hardened subscriber. Great, watch it all, deal with it all. But but uh, realize that this is a uh, a process, a collaborative process that can, can uh, accommodate all these different uh, views, all these different perspectives. All right. So Gloria Chapman, I want to see a, a biography on her, right? I want to see someone really delve into her background. What was her father's uh, profession, right? Because, you know, we we have Kirby Summers looking into Jeffrey Wexner's. I'm not, I'm sorry, not Leslie Wexner, not Jeffrey Wexner. Well, him too, but uh, but Leslie Wexner's father, right? Heusch, is it Heuschel? What did, I forgot a name. Uh, but he was a gangster, okay, to put it simply. <laughs> surprise, 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 as Jim Neighbors used to say on Gomer Pa. Um, but I want to know what Gloria Chapman Abe, Abe right? she's Japanese-American. Her father might be one of them Nisei gangsters, mobsters that my father used to hang around with, right? You know, you see all your Oriental people around in uh, American society, you think they're law-abiding and they're nicey-nicey? And they don't say much, and they don't loud talk nobody, right? Uh, <laughs> don't let that fool you, Jack. They are the biggest mobsters in the world. They are huge. That's one of my specialties here. My 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 thing is like yellow American, Asian American criminality. That criminality is my reality. That's what I grew up with, back, you know, down in Los Angeles. Okay. I'm guessing, uh, just to get you started, you know, someone from Hawaii, some Hawaii boy, you go into Gloria Abbey's family. I bet her father was OSS. I bet he was in, in military intelligence, you know. I'll wager on that because I know there are a lot of Nisei spies. They're all well decorated and the whole history has been whitewashed, how, how heroic they were in, in defeating Nazi Germany. But they weren't nice guys necessarily. They weren't nice people. They, they might have been her heroic in a certain context, but uh, in the post-war setting, when they were when they were working on behalf of American Empire to screw up Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, as well as running operations in in the United States, and and in other countries that that were less strategically crucial at the time. You got to check it out, right? Read my book, Servitors of Empire. Read the chapter I do on uh, Norman Yoshio Mineta. He was the Secretary of Transportation when 9 11 went down. Do you think that he might have had pre knowledge of what was about to go down? Right? Check out that book. That's my first foray into the uh, yellow criminality that runs the world. So though, and I'm finishing this because those of you who just, um, you know, like your Alex Jones types, who just say, "Oh, it's the Chacoms, it's the Chinese," or you know, they just put all like a racial stereotype up there as if it explains anything. It doesn't explain nothing. All right, 
it's just a re, uh, a repeat, a repetition of like 19th century tropes that we have matured. And not because it hurts my feelings. It's because we need more precision and a deeper understanding of um, of these realities of the 21st century. Right. I was on a radio interview last week, TNT radio, and I looked at all the lineup that comes out of Australia. Australia is an Asian Pacific country. What happens in China, uh, Eastern Asia, South Asia has a direct impact more so on Australia than it does here in the United States, given its size and its proximity. But who are the who are the people on the show? There's not one yellow person on it. This is TNT radio based in Australia. Right. I can give you example after example after example. So for those of you who are watching the Professor Hamamoto channel, congratulations. You're way ahead of the curve. Uh, the legacy media and indie media have not figured me out yet. They haven't they don't know where to pigeonhole me. Right. So uh, anyway, that's that's a pitch for for studying <laughs> Gloria, <laughs> Gloria Abe, probably, you know, I don't know. You'll, you'll have to find that. Okay. She has friends, according to Waylon, and I put a note there, page 85, she has friends in high places. What other, He doesn't say what the places are, <clears throat> but <clears throat> we can only imagine. I want to find out. And she's still alive. She's still around. She's running around free. Mark David Chapman's in prison. All right. You know, I was going to go into um, more of the occult aspects of the crime. Whalen doesn't go into it. I think that's, I mean, he doesn't pretend to, right? But um, but I think that's that's going to be my contribution uh, moving into the future. My light's dying, so I have to turn, turn it on. Let's, um, and I'll be back in a moment to close out the show. Let's see what, uh, what David Whalen looks like. See how he rolls. Okay, if you'll bear with me for a couple of minutes here. Let's bring him in here believe almost that the bullets came through John in a direct line of fire and then somehow three of them dive bombed with a revolver so this is not an automatic so it's bang yeah, bang yeah. bang how would he not move I think Mark Chapman was potentially shooting a gun or thinking he was shooting a gun possibly blanks possibly not it was highly likely there was a second shooter the exact circumstances of John Lennon's death over 40 years ago have been widely debated now, this man, TV producer and writer David Whelan, says he is certain the man who was jailed in 1981 for the murder couldn't possibly have done it. And he's got the evidence to back it up. And do you think we'll ever know the truth about uh, who shot John Lennon? No. Whelan has also been able to analyse in great detail the original notebooks from the lead detective in the case, Ron Hoffman. And intriguingly, Whelan's research into the former Beatles' death has raised a series of troubling questions about exactly how the killing was carried out. Mark Chapman has always stated from the day he was arrested to now that he shot John four times in the back. It's almost certain that John was shot in the front. From where John was and where Mark Chapman was, from all evidence and all witness statements, it's almost impossible for Mark Chapman to shoot John four times in the upper left chest area with three passing out in a direct line of fire. The postmortem's never been released because mm. Yoko, for privacy reasons, doesn't want to release it. There's a couple of conflicting things about the postmortem. At the press conference that Elliot Gross gave, he intimated that John was shot two times in the back and two times in the left shoulder, which is where I think the John was shot in the back sort of legend mm. was cemented. But if you look at a death certificate that can be found online, which isn't verified by the way, but it looks pretty authentic to me, it says that John was shot in the chest. And that came from Elliot Gross as well. Whelan points to first-hand witness statements by the surgeon and two nurses who worked on Lennon, all of whom state unequivocally that he was shot four times in his upper chest from the front. It's like a rugby scrum, uh, several nurses and anesthetists that's putting a tube in his throat for his debris for him, uh, people cutting off his clothes. I always thought he was shot in the front, shot four times with three exit wounds in the back. I have to maintain that it was he was shot in the chest. I can't change what I said I knew to be true. Yet retired NYPD lead detective Ron Hoffman in another phone interview claims that is impossible. He was walking towards the vestibule 
Chapman stepped between him and Yoko and shot him. Now, I'm not exactly sure how many feet away he shot him from. I don't think it was more than maybe 10 feet. Oh, he was definitely shot in the back. Yeah, sure. He is, he was the lead detective, so he is the main guy to go to when you want to try and figure out what happened in the investigation and whether the investigation was done properly. Going through the notebooks, there's a lot of interviews which are very useful, so you can figure out what people saw and, and what happened to that point. A lot of conflicting testimony, but what I don't see is any forensics. I don't see any deep insight into what happened on the ground. When you actually put them all together, it, it doesn't add up, and, it, and for me, it should add up. These discrep All right, my light's going out, so I'll be signing off in a moment, but I wanted to hold this video part with the author to the end in case I got a copyright strike and uh, there was a big giant blob right there <laughs> that I had to cut out. So uh, hopefully the, they'll, uh, the YouTube algorithm will allow me to show it. So, but um, that is all to say again, that you have to pick up a copy of Mind Games. You'll learn not just about John Lennon, you'll learn about uh, our American and world hist historical realities here. So I want to congratulate uh, the author, David Willen, for doing such a great job. And I want to thank everyone here in the chat room. I got some really interesting comments. It's going to go on. The chat is going to go on replay once the video has been up for 24 hours. Then the chat will, will go up there. All right. And for new people, subscribe to get the notifications. Uh, we'll be doing some more adventurous work continually, right? including next Sunday, God willing. All right, bless you all. We'll see you soon. All right, thank you. Bye.